Hey everybody, welcome back. It is Tuesday and I thought because it's Tuesday we should do a Tech Tip Tuesday. And a lot of you have written in asking for my thoughts on things like cables, things like power conditioners, power in general, and I thought this would be a great opportunity for me to share with you all of my budget and affordable hi-fi hacks that you can do for little to no money right now. So let's just jump right into it. This first one's kind of a weird one, but one that I discovered many years ago. In fact, I discovered it, I think, around the time that I built a theater around Tekton's Pendragon Theater system. And part of that system was a very, very large subwoofer, and that subwoofer could output a great deal of bass, but as a result, it had a tendency to want to walk. And if you don't know what that means, it's, you know, it can kind of vibrate in shimmy, not unlike a washing machine. And this got me thinking because at the time in my home, I had a washing machine and I had that washing machine on little rubberized isolation pucks made exclusively for washing machines. So I took the pucks off of that, put them underneath that Tekton subwoofer and lo and behold, the subwoofer ceased to walk. In fact, it actually tightened up quite a bit. So my first hack is none other than these little rubber pucks, which are designed to go under a washing machine or dryer, which also work great for subwoofer isolation and it keeps subwoofers from rattling too much also keeps them from walking but benefit being if you have large floor standing speakers that output a great deal of bass these will work as well and in my rudimentary testing i don't want to say scientific testing because i don't have all of the tools but in my rudimentary testing and measurements going back a couple of years now um, these actually perform pretty much as good um, as the quote unquote audiophile kind that costs multiples, multiples more. I believe a four pack of these will run you around $20. I will link to them in the description below if you wanna give them a shot. Needless to say, it's a cheap and affordable hack that has demonstrable effects that are both practical and also audible. So washing machine pucks. Hack number one. Hack number two is for all my vinyl enthusiasts out there. And if you are setting up a turntable for the very first time, or maybe you are changing cartridges on your turntable, you're gonna want to get yourself a stylus gauge. And a stylus gauge is nothing more than a scale that measures the downward force of the stylus pressure on the record. Don't kill me if I didn't say that exactly right, but I think you know what I mean. Needless to say, there are a lot of stylus gauges on the market, many of which are made by some of the finer or higher end turntable companies out there. It is not impossible to spend hundreds upon hundreds of dollars on a stylus force gauge, but this one from Proster that I use uh, every time I set up a turntable is available on Amazon. Again, I will link to it in the description below, and I wanna say it is under $20. And I have compared this against costlier stylus force gauges, some costing hundreds upon hundreds of dollars. And guess what? This little bad boy gives me the exact same measurements as theirs do. So yeah, it may not be made of metal, it may not look as fancy, but what it does, which is measure the downward force of your stylus on your records, it is as accurate as the higher priced offerings, in which case, buy this one. Sticking with the turntable theme, uh, I know this one is kind of a no-brainer, but just in case, you should have an anti-static brush. Um, and there are numerous kinds of anti-static brushes out there, uh, many of which can, again, be very cheap, others can be very expensive. I picked this one up at my local record shop, gosh, years ago, and it has served me well. But one of the things that I find that a lot of people don't have is a stylus brush. Try saying that three times fast. I don't know if you can see this very well, but this tiny little toothbrush-like apparatus is made to wipe debris from the tip of your stylus. And it's not something you have to do every time, but it is something that you're going to want to do every now and again. And it's just a once very lightly over the tip of your stylus before playing a record makes a huge, huge difference that when used in conjunction with one of these, can make your record listening experience all the more pleasing. And the beautiful thing is, is I believe this one is sold in a kit, I'll link to it below, and I wanna say that it costs $10, and it makes a huge, huge difference. 
All right, next we're going to talk about power. Now, I know there are a lot of you out there that have inquired about my thoughts as it relates to power, power conditioners, things like that. First and foremost, I am not the biggest proponent or advocate for high priced power conditioners. And let me tell you why. Um, if you don't have a dedicated line to your system, that is a line that goes straight from your house's junction box directly to your room or a panel in your room that powers your system directly. I don't think, or in my opinion, power conditioners make that much of an audible difference. I'm not saying that they're not important, but a lot of people I think look at power conditioners as as important as say a source component and I just, I don't see it and I haven't heard it for myself. But I do advocate if you can put a dedicated line to your system, one that is not shared with other things in your house, then that is fantastic and you absolutely should do that. And certain amplifiers may even require it. So that is something to look into. But if you don't have that, I always advocate for commercial grade power strips. And the reason, and you can get these at Home Depot, you can get them at Lowe's, I'll link to a few in the description. I use commercial grade power strips and this comes back from my days of doing like home theater rack type systems. And I get the long like four, five and six foot ones. I'd show you one right here, but unfortunately it's connected to my rack. But these have between six to 12 outlets. Like I said, they're three to four to five feet long. And they feature commercial grade surge suppression, which is important, but more, but more than that for me, they allow themselves to be mounted either vertically or horizontally across your equipment rack, thus putting outlets very close to the components themselves. This makes things like power routing very, very convenient. I know that every component comes with a power cable in the box. The problem is, is a lot of those power cables are three to six feet long and if you use the hack we just mentioned about commercial grade long surge suppressors uh, a three to six foot power cable becomes superfluous so measure the distance you need and pick up these smaller 12 to 18 inch power cables they're usually only a buck or two they work just as well but they make the connection from say your av receiver to the power strip all the more manageable and that really is the only hack. It's not that these cables perform any better or worse than the cables that come in the box. They just cut down on the clutter. And for a couple of bucks, they make your rack nice and tidy. Sticking with power for one more example, beyond commercial grade surge suppressors, uh, if you are a home theater enthusiast, i.e. you have a front projector specifically, you're going to want to use a battery backup and you're going to want to connect that projector directly to that battery backup and i know this might sound weird because your projector is on the ceiling and battery backups tend to be quite large and cumbersome but i am telling you you need to find a way to get your projector connected to a battery backup and the reason for that is that in the event of a power outage your projector's fan and bulb are going to shut off immediately just going to turn off the problem is, is that bulb is still going to be white hot and with no fan to cool it, it will explode inside your projector. And if that happens, you at best will be out a bulb, which can be several hundred dollars depending on your projector, or at worst, it could damage the internal components of the projector itself, thus causing for costly repairs if you can have it repaired at all. A battery backup will keep your projector on during a power outage, which will allow you to power it down properly and allow the fans to cycle and thus cool that bulb. And I bring this up because I have had a projector uh, in a power outage where the bulb exploded and it exploded with such force that it actually cracked the case of the projector itself, thus rendering the projector useless. Thankfully, this happened to a review unit, so I was sent another one, but had that been my personal projector, I would have been SOL. So uh, a battery backup, yes, the kind that you would use on a computer, just make sure that it has the requisite uh, output to power your projector for at least two to five minutes while you power it down safely. Sticking with cables for a little bit longer, I know that most components, source components specifically, come with these types of cables in the box. And again, 
there's actually nothing wrong with these cables. There really isn't. I use them all the time. So if this is all you have or the budget you have, go ahead, use these. The problem that I have with these isn't that they sound bad. It's that, again, like power cables, they come in lengths of three, six, and sometimes even nine feet. And because they are super thin, that makes them incredibly flexible. But when you don't want that much cable, well, it can become a bit unruly. So I recommend if you can swing it and you have just a few bucks in your budget, step up to some very basic kind of everyday run of the mill cables like this. Now these aren't fancy. I believe these are Amazon or Monoprice basic, but as you can see, they're just a little bit thicker than the cables that come in the box. Now this thickness doesn't yield better performance per se. I do think that these ends are a bit nicer. They make for a more positive connection, one that isn't prone to shimmy. But outside of that, the reason why I say get some of these is they can be ordered and, and gotten in a variety of lengths, which again, if we're doing proper cable management is important. But second, because they have just a little bit of rigidity, routing them becomes a lot more easy and less unruly than when we're talking about these tiny little things. But again, if you don't have the budget and these came in the box, use them, do not be ashamed of them. But if you have an extra two or $3 in the budget to spend, some very basic RCA or XLR cables in this type of build quality will do you wonders in the cable routing arena. Speaking of cables, I don't attempt to route any cables without some of these very simple uh, Velcro cable straps. And you can buy packets of these. I'm talking 25, 50 units for pennies on the dollar. And some of them are even in colors, which is kind of nice because you can route, say, video cables in blue. You can route audio cables in red. You can route power cables in yellow. And thus, in a, in a blink of an eye, know exactly what you're looking at when you turn to the back of your equipment rack. Obviously, if you don't have a lot of components, which some two channel enthusiasts don't have, you don't need that many, but these are great because they're reusable. They're easy to move. If you ever want to swap cables or change something up, you just simply, you know, unvelcro one of these, you know, move your cables around and then tidy it all back up again. I know a lot of you watch this channel and some of you, uh, jokingly complain about how clean my system is or that you know you never see any wires well you never see any wires because i use these and i use the other hacks in this video like buying wires and cables that are the appropriate length that only go as far as i need them to thus helping to keep them out of view now my last hack isn't necessarily one that you would think of when talking about audio but it is in fact these tiny little gorilla picture hooks and if you're not familiar with these, these are drywall anchors that push into your wall and basically take up about as much space as a push pin, but do not require you to hit the studs and they can hold an insane amount of weight. Do not mount any of your components using these. The reason I'm bringing them up is if you are hanging room treatments and you need to hang them, these are fantastic because let's face it, not everywhere we need to put acoustic treatments, there's going to be a stud. So in the event that there is not a stud where your acoustic panel is supposed to go, these are excellent, excellent choices. And if you ever need to move your acoustic panel in the future, or you decide to move rooms or whatever, the mark they leave in your drywall, like I said, is less or little larger than a nail hole, in which case you can simply put a little fingertip of putty in there, fill it, sand it down and Bob's your uncle. No one knows there was even a hole there to begin with. And they do make these to hold up to a hundred pounds. I believe this one right here will hold 35 pounds, which is more than enough for many of the acoustic panels on the market today. So Gorilla Hooks, I'll link to them in the description below. Awesome, awesome, awesome. But do not, do not try and hang components or component shelves with these. This is for like pictures and acoustic treatments. You've been warned. 
So there you have it. Those are my cheap and effective audiophile, hi-fi, and home theater hacks that you can do for little to no money and buy right now. Again, I have linked to everything in the description below if you want to do your own research and check them out. Other than that, that is today's Tech Tip Tuesday video. If you like this video, maybe we'll do a few more of them in the future. I don't know if I can always cough up fresh new tech tips every Tuesday. But uh, yes, I hope you enjoyed it and thank you so much for watching. If you have a tip that you would like to leave for the class down below, please do so in the comments. And remember, if you liked this video, please do like and subscribe. Give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like this video, go ahead, smash the thumbs down button. And if you want more up to the date uh, updates as far as what is coming into the house, what we're going to be working on next, do be sure to follow me on Instagram where I story and post almost daily about the behind the scenes going ons of this channel. So if you kind of want to stay a step ahead or know what to look out for, you should definitely be following me on Instagram. So that's it. That's my video for the day. Thank you so much for watching everybody. Remember the only person that has to like the sound of your system is you. So happy listening everybody. And we'll see you on the next video. Bye.